headed to the location out at the uh, state park at Lake O.C. Fisher. And this is where the uh, Camaro that was driven by Shane was found abandoned uh, on the day after July the 4th, 1988. So in episode one, we talk a lot about uh, Shane Stewart's Camaro. The unique thing about the find was that in addition to it being abandoned, the door was open and the keys were on the dash. And, you know, it kind of left this impression of who would do that, that particularly for a teenager who valued his car so much. He loves his car. It's his favorite thing. He's very proud of it. So for the cops to say, oh, they ran away and got married, which I think is crazy, they immediately went to they left and got married and left the keys in the car sitting there. And this is way out in the middle of nowhere. It's like miles and miles. If you walked from there, it would take, I don't know, an hour yeah, I mean, to get to town. You know, we get the feeling that there wasn't a lot done between the time the teens went missing and before their bodies were found, at which point a full-scale investigation launched. But the the summary notes that we have only indicate a handful of people interviewed kind of sporadically. It is known that the couple attended the 4th of July fireworks display at Lake Nasworthy and later purchased two soft drinks at Whataburger on Sherwood Way. There's little <clears throat> details that we don't report uh, in episode one that I find really interesting. So the, all the newspaper accounts say the keys were left in the ignition, right? right? And we don't discover, at least publicly, until 1991 with the Unsolved Mysteries episode on this case, that the keys were left on the dash. And so you're wondering, did they do that on purpose, trying to spread to, you know, that little detail so that if they did encounter someone, they might ask them, where'd you leave the keys? I don't know, it's so small, but you wonder about things like that. The kids disappeared in the, in the July time frame. I was out searching, knocking on doors, walking at the lakes, trying to find some kind of evidence. Marshall, Shane's dad, was very adamant, like this was Shane's favorite thing in the world. He would never just walk off like that with no intention of coming back. It didn't make sense at all. That day when they found the car, they called Marshall and had him come out and get the car, and Marshall drove it back home. The sheriff's office, the rangers, everybody now, it's like, that. that's crazy. You would never do that. Like, they, they didn't search for fingerprints. They didn't look to see what was in the back seat. Like, Marshall did a lot of that. Do you think if the investigators had done a more thorough, better job in the, the first hours of finding that Camaro that we'd be, you know, looking at a solved case now? Or? Well, according to Nick Hanna, who's now the sheriff, and he was the Texas Ranger on this case for years, according to him and Terry Lowe, the investigator, yes, it would have been solved. So Nick Hanna and Terry Lowe have taken us out there, and everybody says it looks remarkably similar to what it did. James Camaro was pulled up and parked kind of maybe at an angle with the passenger door open. Set here abandoned on the early mornings of the 5th until it was found by a park ranger. It really meant a lot to go out there, first of all, just to see. And out there, you could really tell they're super frustrated by the case, confounded, like, why can't we figure this out? Like, it just got a little more real and visceral of like, yeah. here, here it is, you know, it's so frustrating to them. I mean, we've thought about the police, we've thought about the investigators, we've thought about these persons of interest involved with the, with the group. We've thought about a random stranger. You just don't know. So Marshall Stewart, um, Shane's dad, really didn't buy the, the story of them just walking off and getting married. Like, I think he knew his son well enough and really trusted his own instincts and was determined to help. So he started videotaping. The crush was here. It's her modified symbol. So this is tape Marshall made. 
in 88. And I think these are the tables they hung out at, at O.C. Fisher. Marshall did deal with the trauma of this and, and the, the unknown, not knowing where Shane and Sally were, by pushing ahead and looking at clues and walking miles and miles and miles around these lakes. Scan around the table. Marshall is attempting to document, well, everything that might have been involved with these teens, but he's particularly focused on the, the Satanism element. Uh-oh. So who would have guessed? Go downstairs and take some more pictures. So in episode two, we're going to hear a lot more from the parents, what they're going through with the loss of their kids. And we're going to have the introduction of, which is a really fascinating part about this whole case, the satanic panic and the Lost Boys, which is... Oh, and thinking of that, in the Camaro, if we go back to the car, one of the stories is that that Lost Boys song was queued up in the tape deck. That's right. So you'll hear about that in episode two. The investigation continues into circumstances leading to the brutal murders of two San Angelo teenagers last summer. Today, local law enforcement officers and the parents of the victims made a desperate plea for any information that might help speed up the investigation.